Hey, everybody out there in internet land. Good morning or good afternoon, evening, wherever you are. I'm Chase Jarvis, your host and guide, founder and CEO of Creative Live. And we're going to have some fun over the next 60 to 90 minutes. This broadcast today has been, uh, I think, somewhere between two and four years in the making. And it brings me a lot of joy to share this particular guest with you today. Um, it's going to be a mix of performance and conversation and before I get into our esteemed guest, I would like to cover a couple of housekeeping things, which is if you are out there in the internet and you'd like to participate in the conversation, help shape it, feel free to chime in with comments and questions wherever you are, whatever platform you're watching. The best experience is going to be at creativelive.com slash TV. If you click join chat, I see those comments first in nearly real time from everywhere on the planet. But if you're watching on Facebook Live, YouTube Live, Instagram Live, uh, Periscope, any of the other number of platforms we broadcast, I do see your comments as well, just uh, maybe 20, 30 seconds delayed. Uh, and I'd like to start off this morning by hearing from you wherever you are on the planet. Type in your, your geography, your location, uh, so I know that we, in fact, have a global audience that I – believe we have if i'm starting to see some some names and locations trickling in here that gives me a, gives me a lot of joy um and while y'all are spooling that up from around the planet i'm going to introduce our esteemed guest after writing chart topping hits for the likes of celine dion ever levine seal and josh groban my dear friend multi grammy and academy award nominated composer songwriter and producer Stefan Macchio is joining us today for a conversation and a performance to cover a lot of ground with respect to creative process, uh, connection, and in part to announce his debut album on Decca Records. The album's called Tales of Solace, which comes out on the 28th of August. This is a super provocative album. I've had the chance to listen to it. Super tender piano meditations that both inspire and soothe the soul. Uh, I, uh, my ability to describe the album uh, would pale in comparison to a performance. So I would like to invite our guest today to open the broadcast with a little performance from his home in sunny Los Angeles, California. Please welcome Stefan Macchio. Chase, <laughs> welcome <laughs> to the show, man. I was my spine, the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. Um, thank you so much for being on the show, man. Literally years in the making, and congratulations on the new album. Years. Um, I just before we get started, I mean, um, I started watching you on, um, I think it was Apple when you were promoting uh, their software Aperture. Wow, that yeah. was a decade ago. That's that's when uh, I said this guy gets it. Uh, you know, he just gets it from a creative perspective, um, and then a lifestyle perspective, and then from that moment on, for the last I think three four years, you've been my very best invisible friend in my ears as I work out every day at the club. <laughs> I think I've listened to every podcast of yours, um, 
and here we are, finally. Uh, this so. is full, full circle, and uh, we have a mutual friend in Michael Gervais. <laughs> um, okay. Your episode on his podcast, Finding Mastery, was so impressive and inspiring. Um, your ability to make the piano work is like few I have ever seen. Thank and you. when I started pursuing uh, all, all of your different social channels, uh, the artistry, the um, empathy, the connection that you bring to not just the process, but to the music, the performance of the music, um, always seemingly drinking red wine, You've got the <laughs> French films in black and white projecting wow. in the background. Um, I was, you know, hoping that, uh, and for those who don't know how this stuff works, you know, you've got a new album out and there's labels and managers and all kinds of stuff that, uh, of course they want to take care of their artists. And, um, but we were happy to jump through the hoops to enable you to play. So I want to first thank you for starting off with a little, oh. uh, a little performance. I hope we have, uh, well, yeah. I'll say we have plans for a couple of more tracks across the, the next 60 minutes or so. Um, but before we do that, I want to go a little bit into your background because uh, so many people find their way into creativity, into music, into performance um, in different ways. And uh, the more that I investigate this, the more I look under the hood of my own experiences, the experiences of the people on the podcast, on Creative Live, I, to me, that's part of what's so beautiful is that there right. is no one path. And your path, uh, I would describe just from reading your bio and what I can find um, from your management and online and a little bit that I do know about you personally is that you started at a very young age. And I'm hoping you can uh, walk us through that. Yeah, I mean, I'll try to give you the skinny. Um, I think uh, now that I'm a, a, a an older uh, human being, um, well into my forties, uh, I've been in pursuit of the truth, uh, through music, um, my entire life. I think, um, let me take you back. Uh, I started piano lessons when I was three years old. Three. Uh, yeah. To be three. <laughs> <laughs> three years old. I mean, it's, uh, shortly after it was like walking and then piano. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, I come from a musical family. That's the thing. So I, I come uh, f uh, French mother, French Canadian mother, uh, Italian father. And uh, I've been blessed in that I come from a household where music is expected and the arts is expected. So the, it was always massaged back, you know, back in my household I, where I had, I had a lot of friends who who um, their parents would shun upon them if they said they wanted to pursue a career in music. Because even to make a living in music, I think it's like less than 1% of the you know, musicians in the world who can. And so I had a very supportive household. Uh, my brother's a, a, a musician himself as well. He's a music teacher now at school. Um, so it, it, all everybody was a pianist uh, on my mom's side, my grandmother, my aunt, you know, my, my, my brother, myself. And of course I went through the, the, the ringroll, like, uh, back in Toronto, um, we called the Royal Conservatory of Music, the RCM, and um, just put in my time, like literally put in my time over the years. I mean, I think that's, you know, I, I, I'm a late bloomer in that I finally, you know, to, to even consider myself um, and to say humbly that I feel like I've finally mastered this instrument. Um, you know, like I said, I'm in my mid forties and I've been playing this instrument for over 42 years. So it's kind of crazy. Um, and when you put your, you put your 10,000 hours in, um, but the piano has been an extension of who I am. It just, it's just literally, uh, I'm so comfortable with it now. It's, I probably communicate better through the keys than I do with words. Um, if that's that what I was sense. trying to capture in the intro, right? What we were talking, I, I, I'm like, I don't, I need to stop talking because just the piano speaking through your fingers is a much better, does no, a much better I, job than I ever could. <laughs> I, I wish I can walk around, have a communication and dialogue with people with a piano in hand, but I can't do that. Um, but, you know, throughout the course of doing that, um, having grown up, I'm Canadian, uh, I grew up in south of Toronto in Niagara Falls, and I, I grew up uh, listening to a lot of American pop culture radio. So, so I was, you know, being immersed in the conservatory side of things with the classical training. And at the same time, I had this love, this passion for pop music. And so the dichotomy of both genres 
um, was something that I really became known for. But I, I knew um, early on that the discipline that you have in learning an instrument, I, I didn't want to stop becoming the best classical pianist I could. So I got my degree in, in um, classical music, in performance and composition. Um, and me, all the meanwhile, I was doing studio work. You know, as a 17, 18, 19 year old, I became a session player uh, and became a, you know, a, a well-known session player in Toronto for Sony Music. And I was performing on a lot of big records at the time. And at the same time, I was studying conducting with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra. So it was it was just wild and 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 my nighttime gig just kind of keep things going. It was I was the 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 lounge piano player at the Four Seasons Hotel, and wow. and 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 in for three years I would I literally played the piano from five to seven thirty every night in the lounge Monday through Saturday, and I and I got hired to perform for a lot of the big um, the, the TIFF the Toronto International Film Festival. They would hire me for like Elton John came to town and hired me to play his party. Um, Tom Hanks, you know, and it was it was it was a real early introduction into sort of that Hollywood scene, if you will, where I all of a sudden, you know, you, you sit there, you're playing and, I'm, you know, one day I was playing and Stain walked in and and, and um, sat down with me to just, just <laughs> right beside me. Um, and I was a kid, you know, I was 18, 19 at the time, 20 years old, and, and I was pounding away. But but all, I'm, all this to say that I I learned the American songbook. And it's sort of like um, by by osmosis, by learning Cole Porter, um, you know, it's um, Misty. I mean, all these great songs um, just got into my fingers and got into my blood. And, and uh, you know, eventually I graduated and... Um, and I just started writing hits, and I became a you know an arranger producer for Sony Music, and my first big hit was uh, with Celine Dion, a song I co-wrote with Aldo Nova. Uh, uh, it was called "The New Days Come," and um, you know global hit around the world. And those kind of songs change your life, and they give you, um, if if anything, they give you the opportunity to sort of start to say no a lot more, mm -hmm. and not choose the B-roll movies just to make a living. If that makes any sense. For sure, um, sure. And and that was and I'm giving you context. I was in my mid to late 20s when I popped my first like number one global hit with Celine, and um, I I had I, I had already burnt out. I think I was you know programming, arranging music, um, barely sleeping, working the job at the Four Seasons, and then all of a sudden um, those kind of songs, like I said, provide you with just a different level of income. And I felt um, for many years, people, they were asking me, what is a good chill piano album to listen to? And and there's a lot of incredible piano players. You know, there's Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, and there's a handful of some good new age contemporary piano players. But I couldn't think of one at the time. And I, I said, you know what? I'm going to take my own little mini sabbatical that time and write my own sort of album that people could, you know, uh, be in love to cook, to read, to uh, be introspective to, if that makes any sense. Um, and that was, you know, over 10 years ago. And and it was a roaring hit in Canada with Universal Music, and it became a number one album on the classical and pop charts. And and it became sort of, I, I, I guess, the genesis of now Tales of Solace 14 years later. But OK, Four, now 14 years. Like, I love that. A, Just like slip big, that in there. <laughs> absolutely. But there's a big gap in between. So in between there, I moved to L.A. and um, life becomes uh, an absolute whirlwind for me here. Um, you know, I think the within six days of moving here, um, I had co-written a song called Wrecking Ball for Miley Cyrus. And it hits number one globally. And my life's spinning. Furniture hadn't yet arrived from Toronto. Um yeah, so that was, you know, family, two kids uh, just trying to, they were, everybody was sleeping on the floor. The furniture hadn't arrived and everybody wants to get in the room with um, the, the person who has the number one song in the world. And, and um, listen, if, if anything I want to share with the, your community is that, you know, there is such a thing as creative burnout. You know, when I had a still string of hits uh, seven, eight years ago, my publisher was putting me in the room, hoping that we'd create another one. And what you don't realize is that hits you can't explain the, the ingredients and the magic formula in creating a hit song they just happen you got to be yeah. prepared for it and i you know they were they were wanting me to write a song a day and i just i don't operate that way some people do 
Um, but you have to save your, you really, you have to preserve your great ideas and hold on to them for the right opportunity. That's what I've learned over the last decade plus. And um, so, you know, I'm back at the piano. I mean, you know, we can talk about that in a second, why I, I decided to come back. But anyway, I hope that's uh Oh, no, this is a beautiful trait. And, and let's just go back maybe uh, 120 seconds to the period where you're talking about, you know, you are a studio musician, you're performing basically eight hours a day, and then you're going to the Four Seasons at night. I mean, that's like so many folks, you know, the classic, what is it, 10 year overnight success or 10,000 hours, all these things you've heard, but you don't actually understand what that looks like on a day to day level. It's easy to say the words 10,000 hours. And, and yet, if you look at the lives of yourself, of the Beatles, of Lady Gaga, so much time is put in mastering. So much time. Yes, so much so time, which requires that you enjoy the process. So talk to me about the process that you go through. Presumably, this is enjoyable most of the time. And as you said, I'd like to put a pin in the burnout because uh, that's a real thing we want to talk about in a second. But talk to me about the love of the process of creating music. I mean, I my second passion is, is probably photography and architecture. Um, and, I, and I bring that up because there's an element of composition in it. Um, but the only thing that's going to get you through those those dark nights, the constant rejection, constant rejection. And and people looking at you sideways, for example, when you, you come with come to them with an idea or a song and you think you think if that's a hit, um, you know, ask me, I still think some of my best work sitting on a shelf unpublished. Wow. And and, you know, but, you know, what do I know? And then all of a sudden, you know, you, you walk into a room one day and you literally, uh, you know, in, in three hours, you write a song called Wrecking Ball and and uh, with two people that you don't know. And it changes your life yet again. Um, but your question was, remind me your no, question. No, it's, but no, it's specifically because about your the process, your the process. Lo loving the process. And in order to, let me just give you a brutish example. I loved taking photographs such that I could put film in my camera, you know, and a handful of rolls in my pocket and just walk and just right. walk into the woods and take pictures for hours. This is when no one's watching. This is, there's no fans cheering you on. There's no time pressure. There's no, this is a love of the process of composition and creating and experimenting and making mistakes and recovering. And, you know, that to me, that is a, it's a requirement for, um, for, I think for greatness or for Absolutely. mastery in any field. And I want to know what your experience of the process of playing the piano is. Is it, you know, clearly if you're going to do something for 12 hours a day, you have to enjoy it. Was it, was there a pressure there? Was there a joy there? Was there a, an abandon? Was it like, were you, you know, how did you reconcile all of the hours with, um, you know, your love for the music. I, I think, as I mentioned to you before, I mean, my relationship with this instrument, the piano, is uh, so intimate. Um, I probably had a conversation with this instrument more than anyone in my entire life. Like, like I've spent the most time with this living, breathing piece of wood more than anyone in my life. Um, my process, in a lot of ways, as early as I, I was probably 10 or 11 when I, I started to understand the relationship between notes. So when I saw that this, these created basic chords of music, all of a sudden I would start to just make my own mistakes at the instrument and 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 develop my own language, my own harmonic language. And I just sometimes will just just sit down and have a conversation. I'll do this for two three hours. Um, and, and that sort of, uh, 
the prelude to my process, even in recording piano music, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, I go out of my way to record off the click. Um, for people who don't understand what that means in pop music, you have a rigid, you record to a metronome or in a computer. So you got. Now in piano music, I mean, um, I wanted to come back, you know, after being involved, producing, co-writing these massive, massive songs with sometimes north of a hundred tracks with orchestras to the reductive element of the piano. Just one, it's like one individual, myself talking, a piece of wood and myself just kind of hearing my own thoughts again. So because I have a nice studio and I, um, it's, it's my own studio, I, I can sit and have this conversation and record and just put my hands down at the piano and play for hours. And then listen to myself and edit what I think is the best part of that conversation and have a piece of music be that raw. I mean, Tales of Solace on this album, every, no, there's nothing that's punched in in this album. It's everything is just literally a stream of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And and I hear it when I hear other piano players. I kind of go, ah, that individual is using a click um, or that person's not. And, 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 you know, we could sit here and philosophize that the world has needed uh, room to breathe. I mean, here we are, we're all quarantined right now, but pre-quarantine, my like my creed was bring like reduction, reduction, reduction. Simplify. My world was too busy. My world was too big. I moved to LA and, and success happened. And I was just like, I fucking can't take this anymore. I just, I just, I just want to hear myself think again, which is why silence and, and, and peace and solace are so important to me. I like, I strive to protect my creative time. I strive to protect my time alone at the instrument because it's it's one of the few things that brings me just just you know allows myself to you know hear myself thought that my th my my thoughts et cetera et cetera. So um, anyhow, again, a lot. Well, yeah. Well, let me let me let you know some. We got people coming in from all over the world. We've got England. We've got South Africa. We've got Arizona. I'm yeah. Um, couple of folks chiming in, just wanted to say some nice things. Um, Espacio says, congratulations, love your exposure album. Part of the, uh, Hey, Jeff Slobotsky out there. Nice to see you guys. Um, Stefan is a genius. Derek says, uh, that's from YouTube. Nice. Um, okay. A little bit about your process. We, we touched on that. I want to go forward now, let's say 10 years to being blocked. You talked about putting in all your time and speaking of time, um, Mayor M-A-I-R says, I'm at the beginning of my process after 20,000 hours. Wow. So we've got, you know, we've got, you've mastered your instrument. You've been playing 10 hours a day for 20 years and how do you how do you make the time that you have with that with your piano? How do you make it special? Because at some point you you know you get blocked. You have a couple of hits, and you know what we call in uh, what they say in sports is the uh, sophomore jinx, right? Or I guess that's right. even in music, the album like the uh, the second album is always hard. So you've had this first wave of success. Let's say pre moving to LA. How do you keep going when things are tough? Um, it's, it's an excellent question. Um, I know you had David Foster, um, who was a friend and mentor of mine on the show recently. And David, uh, he called me up after my first hit, uh, you know, 15 years ago with Celine. And he says, congratulations. Now your second one is going to be even more difficult. And he was right. There was actually like a gap in between, yeah. if that makes any sense. Oh, and, for sure. And and however, I was probably more prolific in that gap. Um, I was more creative than I ever was. And um, I really enjoyed uh, your interview with Steve Aoki uh, lately, as well, recently as well. And and Steve said something very true. Um, and I just said it earlier. Is a lot of times people think uh, because you see the streaming number, if you go to Stefan Maki on Spotify, you see that this song has. Uh, 8 million streams and the other one only has 200,000, that's the 8 million is better. And that's not the case. That's not the case. Um, but it's, it's, um, Jesus, I'm just getting sidetracked here. You're, you're, no, I love it. No, I, I love it. So when, when you're burned out or when someone like okay, so, okay. David Foster says, yes. 
hey, kid, good job, but get back to work is essentially what he's saying to you, right? Uh, working and creativity to me, I don't know about everybody else. It is a muscle. Like I, there's, so I've written my biggest songs on the days that I, I was most uninspired, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. So I think walking into this room here, this studio, um, it's like going to the gym. I mean, you don't, you don't want to get up in the morning necessarily and do it, but and after you don't re ever regret the after results. Like, you know, right. once you've exercised, you don't say, ah, fuck, I, hate I wish, it. yeah, I wish I didn't no. hit the gym. No one said that ever. <laughs> no, ab absolutely not. And the same thing with piano, because, um, I, you know, even, even though I love spending my time here, there's just kind of days where I kind of go, why, you know, I, I just don't want to do this. But then all of a sudden, because I can come up with a melody in my head and be obsessed with it and work it through. Or the other way people ask me, how do you compose is I just literally put my, my fingers down and then you kind of see what happens. And then it, just go with it and 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 you go and you go and you go and next thing you know um you may That's, have but that is just for anyone who is identifies as a creator you've felt these moments of flow and flow doesn't happen before you start that's the thing that most people miss right and just for example you say i set my hands on the keys and then i see where it goes notice you didn't say i sat on the bench and looked at the keys you know, you had to actually start doing something. And it's like at the gym, you have to start moving your body. And it, it's, it's, you, you can't, I don't know, to me, this, this act of doing, I think it's interesting that every one of your, when you, when you have just touched the piano and played something beautiful, you know, a strung a couple of notes or chords together there for us, you know, you're always, the first thing you're doing is touching. You, you're actually, the act of creating inspires the next note. It's almost like you're pulling on a thread or walking down a path. Um, so I, part of hearing the piano makes me want to hear, hear more of the piano. So before we do, I, I want you to start thinking about what, what track may be off your new album you might be willing to play for us. In the meantime, there's a, a bunch of questions um, well, first of all, it's important for me to say that uh, John Bracey, your university professor, is on in the comments, Goodness giving, giving you a shout out. And, um, <laughs> I, love, I love John Paul. Um, and but it, importantly, a question has just come up um, about creating success for yourself. So the, those folks are yes, we're all putting in our hours, Stefan, but how do we get noticed? Because you've spent, you know, 10% of the last 20 minutes using words like Celine Dion and Sony Music and Universal. And these are all, you know, global brands um, tagged with, you know, multi-platinum hits tagged with big dollars. And yet there are so many of us who are waiting for our break who are have not yet seen or found or connected with the person that can help us um, we have not published enough music to be recognized as a master we have not you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so in part for mayor m-a-i-r prudence right. what did you do in order to get recognized was it just a matter of showing up was it some uh, was there some hack some uh, trick I know, it? and, I, and every, there again, there's no formula to it, but I, you know, my mom um, always told me, uh, do what you love and the money will follow. You know, I, I was, I, I've been broke uh, many times, uh, you know, make a lot of money, go broke. It's, it's the classic spirit of the entrepreneur. Um, but I, you know, you, and you have to have the stomach for it. The thing, but you know, a lot of us, you know, today, and I find, I just, I just generalize everybody. We want a shortcut to greatness without putting in the hours, right? You know, you know how many times the, the record labels come to me after after doing Earned It for the Weekend? And they want that big orchestral fancy sound. Um, and, but, and I you know I'm not blaming labels, but they don't realize, I mean, God damn, I mean, 30 years of my life, I've been studying Brahms, I'm studying, you know, Shostakovich, you know, Mozart, Beethoven, deconstructing their scores, you know, late at night in the library. 
and and understanding the voicings and how to put you know violins together to make that sound. But I mean, it just didn't happen overnight. And and I don't you know I don't you know, you know that's the problem. A lot of people say, oh, you make it you know you you the 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 great ones make it look easy. But you know, and there's no such thing as genius as well. I mean, Mozart was called a genius. John Williams. John Williams's best answer was, no, I'm not a genius. I'm just a guy who works hard. That's all I do. I work so so hard, and I work hard. Yeah. Um, and 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 I'll never forget that. I was. You have to be ready. You've you've said this as cliche. Not not to you, but I'm saying this is a cliche quote. You have to be prepared to be uncomfortable. It's the same thing. I was ready, and I have. Like I said, when I was a kid, I took the risk on me. I was taking the loans from the bank to get the microphones in order to create the song to sell the Celine Dion. I took the risk with yeah. my manager, and you know, it wasn't it wasn't a label. And all of a sudden, the people are there to collect when you are successful. And you learn a lot of great life lessons on the other side of success as well. And you know, and another thing we can spend a whole podcast on is dealing with the balance of not having work and the opposite is maintaining success, which is really, really tough. But um, um, listen, I mean, I just, again, I go off on my, my rant, but- No, I, do you, well, is there any prescription other than just continuing to practice? Like, is it about, for to, in order to get noticed? And because I think the- the we fall in love with rock stars because they pour their souls out on the stage for us and cool. yet if they're pouring their their souls out in their parents basement and no one ever hears that music or never no one ever sees the you know they don't see the light of day or they're not intentionally putting themselves you said you talked about taking risks but i want to know specifically what are some things that you've done to put yourself in the arena, to Good. be at a place where other people who can, because look at, even though you, like you may consider yourself a solo artist and this goes to anyone out there, nothing happens in a vacuum. Everything requires a community. And so I'm curious as our um, Sky and Stella and Gina and John and Ali and Shantae who are tuning in from all over the world, want to know how, what did you do specifically to build some community, to put yourself in the right rooms to get the uh, attention that you have clearly received? I mean, you just said it there right at the end, to get in the room, the right room with the right people. Um, and I, I may I may shoot myself in the foot for saying this, but we also live in a different age. But, I, you know, again, I'm aging myself. But back in the day, pre-YouTube, pre-internet, uh, Instagram, and all that stuff, um, you physically had to be in a big city. So in Canada, I, I grew up, like I said, in a small town called Niagara, Niagara Falls, Niagara on a Lake. And it was south of Toronto, but I knew that I had to get myself to Toronto as fast as possible, okay? Because it, it's the mecca of, of, of Canadian pop culture. But I also knew in the back of my mind that Toronto, uh, God bless, I love, love my hometown, um, if I want to go all the way, mm -hmm. I had to move to Hollywood eventually at some point. Um, and, and I, and I can, you know, the proof's in the pudding. And the thing is, you know, I, I'm a big believer in being in the same room as somebody. Um, if you live in a small town, you have to use the tools. If you don't have the finances, of course you have to use it. We, I mean, we live in, a, in an era now where you can crack. I mean, Bieber, Justin Bieber is from a small little town outside of Toronto, Ontario. I mean, he got discovered. And you know, one of the biggest pop stars today now, um, but people want to know how they how they break it in. Um, you know, for me, it happened, you know, for example, a great story was when I'd already had. I wrote an Olympic theme for Vancouver, I have to say that, and that's you know, that's, that's you become it's it becomes part of a national your national pride and you hit a ceiling once you write uh, an Olympic theme for your nation. And I, at that point, it was I was looking at myself sideways and saying, I have no place else to go other than Hollywood, um, and 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 I say Hollywood uh, in that, um, you know, I I wrote a song, covered a song with The Weeknd, called uh, Earned It, and had had I not been living here, Chase, I, when I got the call from Sam Taylor Johnson, the director of that film, when they were spotting their end credit song and they needed something that sounded like Marvin Gaye and had an old, you know old feel. If I, I couldn't show up to that spotting session in that screening room within 45 minutes, I wouldn't be 
nominated for an Academy Award. I wouldn't have performed with, you know, Abel. We, we wouldn't we wouldn't have the Grammys. Like none of that would have happened if I wasn't geographically living in Los Angeles. So, you know, short, short answer is get yourself to LA, get yourself to New York, get yourself to London. I mean, you know, uh, Berlin, I'm just the, the, the big cities in the world that, that, that have culture, the big cities that have connections. Um, you, you can crack with social media, but the thing is relationships uh, are everything, as you know, and, yeah. and it's, it's people. And it's, yeah. it's like, not until they hear you living, breathing in the same room, that, that magic really starts to happen. It's uh, so anyhow. Speaking of relationships, I would love to hear a little bit more uh, about your relationship with the uh, instrument sitting next to you there. <laughs> um, and again, if you're just joining, um, I want to say welcome to this gigantic. Now we got, I think I just, I'm, I'm counting. We're in the 30 some 20, 20 different geographies, including states and countries. So we're probably, um, it's fair to say global. Uh, I want to welcome you. I'm with uh, Stefan Macchio, and we are about to hear a couple of new tracks, or tracks rather, off his new album, Tales of Solace, which is coming out uh, the 28th of August. And um, this has been a couple of years in the making. And then when we decided that we could make it happen, we needed to. Uh, you know, get all the jump through all the hoops so that you could actually perform. So I'm going to stop talking and let you uh, do what you do among the very best on the planet, and that is play the piano. It's a song called Fracture, and um, it literally is just that it's fractures of a relationship. going don't don't let me stop you keep going okay. give me one more give you one more um a song called um whitby um actually pertains to a town where dracula's from and i i met someone special who opened my world to that um here is whitby
face. <laughs> oh man. I'm so- um. Maybe it just sounds extra, extra good to me because uh, I'm, you know, we got a pipe directly. I just, I mean, no, 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 no. That's that's the, the, yeah. the hairs on my arm are standing up. <laughs> uh, I'll play you. I'll play a few more. Um, but I just, you know, I just thought about this as I was playing. I wanted to explain to people, uh, all the musical people on this on this particular broadcast here, what's special about this piano. Um, it, you know, people don't realize they. I get a lot of. Um, messages asking me why does your piano have a velvety muted sound and stuff like that and i have a a great relationship with yamaha pianos this is one of their like premier upright pianos but more importantly there's a piece of felt in here so so for example if i lift this up and i play that same piece that i just did listen to how abrasive it sounds the mute. Anyhow, two for that. But but just what that sounds like to me, Stefan, that sounds like mastery. That sounds like knowing your language enough. You've you've played enough to have your own voice. And that's a question that I'm seeing a lot in the comments here. Again, they're starting to move a little bit faster than I can keep track of them. But uh, how did you develop your voice? Is it time? Is it um, like when do you know something's truly yours? You talked about, you know, studying the masters and deconstructing their work. And and how does that translate into you finding your own voice? And, you know, um, I guess, yeah, just finding your voice and and creating that personal style that you just demonstrated so perfectly for us. Um, Again, uh it's a great question. I, I you know, I, I, through the years, in my entire life, and I still do this, I'll do this to the day I die, um, but you know, there's a million ways I'm playing a C major scale. I'm just now giving a master class in, in music. But I mean, you know, to spice that up, you can actually you know, change the inside of the of that that chord where it make it sound a little more interesting. And that just comes with like years and, and, and you know, and hours and just kind of seeing trial and error, what works, what doesn't work messing up the sound. I mean, there's really nothing wrong you can do at the piano. There's just more pleasant sounds that you can create. There's, you know, every sound you can go like that, or you can go like, like, and you know, but it's just seeing what works and the relationships between, I know a trick that people will ask me a lot of times is how you know, can you transpose on the spot? Um, and you know, so fast. I mean, there's patterns in the keyboard that I that I see. There's just it's like a puzzle in a lot of ways. And and once you kind of decode the instrument, you you can like you can do literally anything. I mean, you know, for all the musos out there, I mean, Cole Porter, one of the greatest songwriters of all time, can only play in one key, G flat major. And people go, God, G flat major is murder. Like, no, it's not. It's actually one of the easiest keys to play. Even do a, a do a scale in G flat major, but. Cole Porter was not trained and he just wrote, you know, like, you know, I'm dreaming of a white Christmas. Um, and, yeah. <laughs> so uh, all in the same key. And then eventually, the you know, the, the arrangers transposed it for him. But well, uh, so okay. that's so all that to say. I developed my own musical language. I mean, David Foster from the pop side of things. I I listened to his records for years, and 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 then eventually just sort of made my own voicings happen. Um, and is that and that is a product of repetition and and you know clearly practice, sure. But how much of that came from fear? Like, was that a overnight that you just said, okay, this is this is who I am, and this is my voice? Um, what if I get it wrong? I'm trying to like think of the, the, the questions that we all, all of us who identify as creators or entrepreneurs are sitting at home. Like, is this the right, is this, am I, should I clean this? Is this my thing? How do you know if it's the right sound? How do I know 
So what, what kind of language is going on in your head? When I, I don't, or, yeah, I, I don't think you do know. And, you know, it's not like, and I never woke up one day and said, I wanted to be an artist. You know, it's, I think, you know, it's just kind of in you. Um, I, I woke up and I, as I, became a student of music, um, I would listen to records and I would sometimes get upset if I didn't hear an inversion or a chord played the right way um, and where it could be played better. So all of a sudden, you're, if you're going to complain about things, you actually have to take the matters into your own hand and, and just do something about it. Otherwise, just shut the fuck up. Excuse me. But it's just like, stop complaining. Um, so in the same, that same creed is how I play, I apply it to, to music. If I'm going to sit there you know how many times, how many times have you or like of all of us like sat and said, how did that song make it to the radio? And you kind of <laughs> go like, like, you know, and, and I say I still say it today. I mean, you know, and th that's why I sort of taken this sort of sabbatical for a minute from pop music, because I was frankly getting tired of it. I just, you know, I just not, pop music is intoxicating when it's amazing and there's amazing pop writers. But there's so much politics that, you know, put the wrong songs at radio and um, that commerce drives the wrong art. So I said, you know what? I'm in a position again. Just shut up and just go back to the piano and 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 create something that you want to listen to. I, that's it, right there. That's the right point, there. right? That's what do you want to listen to? Exactly. What do you want to like? What would you like to see more of in mm -hmm. the world? I wrote Creative Calling because there was a book that I didn't get when I needed it most. And I couldn't see it out there in the world. If you hear a song and it rubs you the wrong way, what's the song that you would replace it with? Whether this is a book, a photograph, a painting, a piece of art, a piece of architecture. A this is where. Yeah, no, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. You're, no, you're, I'm just ranting because this is like I, I think you just said it so eloquently. It's like do the work if you're seeing something out there and it doesn't it doesn't sound right to you. What does sound right to you and what can you do to put it out there in the world? You owe it. To the world, especially, you know, if you are sitting there, uh, you know, sort of um, lamenting in your brain about what's out there in the world, go but, ahead, make something beautiful, put it in, that, put it out there. If you're in a position of of some type of influence or power, um, it, where people are actually listening to you, I think the older I get, the more difficult it becomes to be, you know. You have to honor that voice. You have to listen to it. Um, the older you get, the, you know, you just become the, your mortality is questioned. So all of a sudden you're saying, listen, if I don't do it now, I'm never going to do it. Like literally after after a certain point, um, you know, I'm going to completely go on to something because there's something I want to show and share with our, you know, with with the community here is is let's just deconstruct one mega song that I've been part of, um, you know, Wrecking Ball, for example. OK. Um, we have Wrecking Ball. Before you, before you deconstruct it, just play a few bars just so the people just like, okay, great. I, I'm reuniting with the song and exactly. then deconstruct it first. Okay. <laughs> um, but it, Wrecking Ball, in a lot of ways, is a is a piece of classical music. I mean, th just the chorus alone. I mean, it's a tender piano melody. And, and it's it's a, almost like a piece of Baroque music. And so when you actually strip down the song itself and, and Miley heard the song stripped down, um, it wasn't, you know, the bombastic production it ended up being. Um, it was she just heard it a, a piano vocal. I mean, so I, I just I just again just want to show people that the elements, every piece of information on a creative level is provided for you in the piano playing and the vocal. For wrecking ball.
but you know, um, and so forth, and the rest is history. <laughs> Just bangs out global mega hit, and the rest is history. Um, um, speaking of history, you are about to make it with your first uh, day solo debut album. What's it like to go from playing and performing music that you are collaborating with others on? writing songs, producing songs for others, and your name on your album out there in the world. Talk about the the movement from one space to this new space, which we, uh, I think some folks are putting the link mm -hmm. to pre-order your album available uh, August 28th here. What's the, what's the gap there? Because that seems big to me. But Let's, I mean, can I just kind of take you back when I decided I wanted to come back to the instrument? Uh, do it, do it, so, take us there. Okay, so after after being involved again with Miley and, and The weekend and a bunch of big hits, I, I was, we were cutting strings in London, England uh, in 2018 for Celine Dion. And I, I was, um, I have to remind people that I'm Canadian. Uh, and I say that because uh, Canada is a very interesting cultured country. I'm sitting there waking up uh, before the string section, string session in London that day for Celine and classical music came on. And I just felt like an imposter a little bit in pop music for the longest time. You know, you we can write our greatest songs and it was frustrating for producers. And we don't talk about the fact that I could pour myself in and I, I believe I've written some even greater pop music that, that hasn't been released, but the label, the management can all decide to nix it. And all of a sudden your work doesn't go anywhere. And that, I experience that frustration all the time, even at my level every day for years. I mean, you know, the amount of success I've had, I've had so much, as much failure. So I was sitting there in London and it was so clear to me that I had to come back to the piano. It's just, so I'm not doing this to be recognized. I'm, I do this because I feel that there's, a, you know, there's a, there's a lane that's hasn't been taken over yet. I mean, there's incredible pianists that I admire in, in this genre. There's the Max Richters, there's Ludovico Einaudi. Um, Niles Fromm's, uh, there's a lot of great players, but um, I finally felt also as a man, and I say that, um, you know, I've had perhaps the darkest and happiest year and year and a half, you know, uh, of my life going through a lot of changes that I finally felt I had something to say. And I, again, I don't communicate through words. That's the beauty of this album. It's not, there's no words, it's international, it's universal because it communicates straight to the heart. It's how my fingers connect with the piano and in, in, and touch somebody in, in, in Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Australia, and, and I don't have to be part of that culture. And that's the beauty of music. It's, 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 just, it's the most universal language. Um, so I just, I literally felt compelled to just shut everything down pre-quarantine, which is kind of spooky. You know, I was feeling like I needed to return back to myself to the values, you know, living in LA is, is, is exciting. And it's also, um, it's, it's a tough town. Noisy. It, it's noisy. It's noisy. There's a lot of noise here and, and you can get distracted very easily. Um, you can get in with the wrong people very easily here and, or vice versa. You can, you can go, you can go the opposite way. And I just kind of had to listen to myself. It took a trip to London, England made to make me realize that I needed to come back to the instrument. And, um, and literally unpack everything and just shut down from doing some pop music for a minute. It doesn't mean I'm not going to continue writing pop music, but it just means that I'm just throwing myself back at this instrument, ready to tour the world when it's ready, you know, in the next year or two, when we can kind of get back on the road um, and bring just beautiful music. Um, again, I needed it in my life. So I, I figured if I need something, chances are it's going to connect with millions of millions of people. I've always listened to that instinct. And if, if I'm if I'm if I'm missing something, chances are that many people globally are missing that same thing as well. Yeah. And, and in the particular is the universal, right? That that if you're feeling it like that's another reason doubling down on yourself is it ends up being universal and speaking universal. I'm, you know, looking at the track list mm -hmm. and, you know, these are you know, many of life's most profound themes like fracture, change, nostalgia, solace, ghosts, like I'm, I'm just reading, you know, light, um, 
Like I'm, I'm yes. reading like the, these are our song titles, and you're clearly not wrestling with trivial concepts here. Um, they're, they're not, and and I think you know we don't have time to go into them. But I, I decided to put my my situation and and the stories will roll out over time for me. And I have there's a story behind every song, as you said. You know, it's and the title I even battled with the title of this album forever because you know it's to me it's a story. It's it's like a male for a lot of ways. It's a male breakup album. It's it's an album to be to to wallow in to 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 the watch be to keep you comforted on a rainy day to be sad to, um, I, you know, to, to and as I said to you earlier to even to study to to be introspective to. I mean, I I do a lot of research or reading, if you will, on the brain and the cortex and you know the tempo of music and what what how many hit songs have been at specific tempos and. Why, for example, Baroque music allows the brain to absorb more material because it typically Baroque music at, at 60 BPMs, it opens up the cortex, you can enter more information. So a lot of that stuff goes into the thought process for me as well. Um, and that's why I keep on using the word conversation because um, I have to, I just, I, I try to be as subjective as honest as I am when I'm editing my piano stuff. And, and sometimes if there is a mistake in it, because I mean, you're going to hear that in the wood of this instrument, I'm going to let that slide if the attitude of the note is correct, if that makes any sense. I don't care if there's like, if there's a slight like wrong distance, dissonant note, but if, if I'm communicate, communicating the emotion, I'd rather keep that in rather than try to fix it up and clean it up. Um, there's a there's a there's a, a book that someone gave to me a, uh, a few years ago called Wabi Sabi and I don't know you know again um, I have it on my shelf you do right okay. here it's the next next room directly <laughs> above me I have it it's white with it's, green green letters you, you you know it then right and I do. and it's and in many ways it's allowing because uh, things there's perfection and imperfection I mean grit's a big thing and I know that you 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 are a big fan of that and 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 with Angela who's been on the show many times with you I think um things are transient nothing's really everlasting if that makes sense and the and the more that you're able to accept that the better off I think you are at least I am now as an adult I find that I'm more you know there's there's a calmness to me as you can tell my brain rust races I I stumble over my words half the time because I was always a victim of uh, analysis, over analysis, paralysis. Mm -hmm. And that's what these albums are as well for me. They're therapeutic, they're healing, because I got to get out of my own way, if that makes any sense. It does. Um, but that's and that's like these these huge themes. And if you if you connect these huge themes, you're dis dissecting your own personal experience and you're doing it through action, right? You're not you're, you're just you're playing. What does it sound like? What does it feel like? What's the emotion? Is it working or not? Trusting your instinct like this is just this like it's an amazing feedback loop that obviously has produced uh, 16, 16 <laughs> insane tracks. Well, well, thank you. I mean, but, you know, people don't realize I probably recorded 20, I 20, 23 hours of music, reduce it to three, reduce it to 52 minutes. And <sighs> And that's, you know, you know, in that, that process, it took me maybe, um, to, to release this album has taken forever, to be honest, but the recording process has only taken a few months. If that we and started then, talking about having you on the show when you, I, I believe back when you started recording, right. We, we started, did. we started communicating, um, <laughs> a couple of years ago and, you know, I had taken to, uh, your social feeds and again, you know, you backlit with the. French cinema in the background and glasses of red wine. And I'm like, wow, this is really cool. And it's just, you're doing your own thing. And, you know, we're like, cool, I'm recording an album when the time is right. You know, I would, you know, I'd, I'd love to be on the show. Thanks for the invite, Chase. And that was two years ago. That was, that was <laughs> two years ago. And, and, you know, I, it's um, because I, I connected clearly with, with what you've been you know, spreading for the last so many years, um, and you as a creator yourself. And I said, this guy gets it. Um, and, and there's so much that I, I, I feel like I can share. There's so much, um, that I want to expose about the process. There's so much I want to expose about sometimes when you say that the industry, um, there's, you know, there's a lot of, I think it's important to hear from a guy like me, you know, I work with some of the most incredible artists. I'm not going to call them incredible. I work with some of the most successful artists, but successful doesn't mean the best. 
Um, you know, I sit there and some of them truly are the best. I can sit there and tell you that Celine Dion is one of the best singers in the world because she is. I mean, and she'll sit there for 12 hours until she gets every note right emotively. And I, I've also worked with successful artists that I'm kind of laughing and going, why the hell am I like spending my time and this person can't sing and I'm trying to fix their notes, their song, their, their voice on autotune. And all of a sudden they become a big pop star. It, it, you feel a bit like a fraud at times, um, it, but you know, that's, I guess that's pop culture. You know, it's fabricated. You know, we always say we're living our best life on Instagram. We don't show the, the, the gritty side, the bad side, the ugly side. And, and there's also an ugly side to music and there's an ugly side to it. So I think, you know, for me, I've just, just returned to the, the instrument that I'm most truthful with. That's all. I just, from, it, I come back to the word therapeutic and, and healing because the, the truth just sounds different though, you know, and Steven from YouTube live says there's no such thing as right sound mm -hmm. and wrong sound. There's just sound and mm -hmm. your sound this is the part where you said early on in our conversation about sort of doubling down on yourself, doubling down on what your own experiences are, doubling down on the experiences that can make you feel the emotions like fracture, sea change, light. Um, exactly. Like, <laughs> you know, what does the process of learning to trust yourself look like? Because clearly at some point you didn't trust yourself. Talk sure. to me about the, the con contrast when you didn't trust yourself and when you started to. Uh, I think I think I just when I when I was hiding behind. Um, that's not to say, listen, when you're producing some, some with these artists doesn't mean that every time I'm hiding, but sometimes you can just kind of get buried and hide behind uh, a song and produce. And and I, I, I was guilty of it in the beginning where I would just even with production, I would just put element instrument after instrument after instrument just thought wall of sounds better bigger the better then you quickly realize it's not you know and then you you realize and then you study design and you study you know architecture and you realize that if everything is built properly it's like a salad you go to a five-star restaurant and, and 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 all of a sudden you go simple salad why does it taste so great uh, it's because the lettuce was picked probably that day <laughs> um the, you know, the, this is an amazing analogy, by the, the way. This the, is the amazing. Vin the vinaigrette was made. I mean, you know, one of my favorite analogies that I want I, I want to enlighten all of us, you know, looks, we live in an, an age now. I mean, if we asked anybody under the age of 25, everybody probably believes under the age of 25 that music should be free. We devalued music. Everything else has become more expensive in life. But we'll pay $4.95 for a Starbucks caramel frappuccino. And it's in your stomach. And it's gone, but we won't pay a dollar twenty nine for a single. When my parents have probably spent a th hundreds of thousands of dollars on my musical education, put me through school, I've bled, I've I, you know I put in the hours, and and we think that we 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 complain at nine ninety nine uh, Spotify membership to have uh, music unlimited. It, you know, people have bled. They've gone to school. They've 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 studied for 10 15 20 years to create that song to, to get in a relationship to just be hurt badly emotionally and bring you that piece of music that, that puts the goosebumps on you i think music's healthier than that starbucks coffee for 4 bucks go spend the dollar 29 but we're too late we've already taught people that music should be free but that's again another sort of rant of a 40 something year old but it's 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 um I don't know where I'm going. No, there's, but there, there's, however you show up to support artists, maybe that's a reasonable takeaway, right? You're, you're, if it's the 10 bucks on Spotify, more importantly, when we get out of this pandemic, it's showing up to see uh, performance live. And, you know, I've, I've seen a couple of comments here. Uh, again, they're flowing by people who have seen you live. And I think one one word I saw was breathtaking. And to that end, can you play something else for us? I can. It's, it's uh, we're not in the room with you, but it feels damn close. And uh, if you don't, if you have headphones on right now, or you're listening on your phone as you're uh, on a walk around the lake, or um, maybe uh, if you're at the gym, why don't you sit down on the bench here and listen? Um, 
I'm dying. I, it feels like I'm in the room with you, maybe because I have some quality headphones on. But um, well, uh, just to that point, before I play, I, I I want to quickly talk about the fact that you know to create the vibe in here. I what you don't see on the other side of this computer is that there's a, a pretty big floor, a, a big studio with three other acoustic pianos. You know, there's a big, you know, I've got a big grand piano there um, and a couple other uprights and stuff like that. And uh, I got an incredible engineer who's responsible for making sure even the podcast is well mic'd. Um, it sounds incredible. Thank you. That's Jay Paul Bicknell. Now, um, but when I did this album chase, I wanted to make sure that my this particular this is the piano room. This is an actual ISO booth that we transformed into a sort of mid-century apartment to make it feel like like I was literally like living by myself. And the only thing I was, I was a broken human being with an instrument. And so that I can have this intimate relationship with the, with the piano. So on that note, I'll um I'll play you. And we created that in this this bigger complex here in Santa Monica. Um, and it, I will play you a song called Sea Change. Um, again, uh, which this song, I don't even know where it came from on the album. I was just improvising and all of a sudden I heard it and I said, damn, I said that just kind of came through, through me and, um, here's Sea Change and thank you so much. Goosebumps you talked about, I can, like, hair standing up on my arm. Um, that was Sea Change. Sea Change. Off uh, Stefan's new album and comes out on the 28th, but uh, maybe all in a different, um, maybe the folks who are tracking this on my team can cut and paste a way to pre order that. I'm sure we'll, we'll take care um, of yeah, for sure. We we gotta make sure that that's in there. And um, again, Stefan Macchio, tell us uh, the space comment you made right before you started playing resonated with myself and uh, with a handful of folks in the comments here. Uh, Gina particularly wants to hear us talk about this physical environment you created, essentially a mood. I wrote about it in uh, in Creative Calling and. You've mentioned architecture. Great book. Um, I mean, I haven't, I haven't, uh, no, I, we'll, we'll talk about that at some other point. But, you know, thank it, you. It's, um, this, you know, architecture you've mentioned, the space you're talking about, how, th how things make you feel. I, I'm, talk to me about, about that, about the environment yeah. that you've set up for yourself as a creator you. when you step into the studio. I think that's, you know, an, an addendum to the, your earlier question, you were talking about process. I think, you know, to, in, to success, to ensure, and whatever success means, success doesn't mean like, you know, fame and all that kind of the bullshit. It just means success in creating something authentic and pure. 
So in order to do that, um, you have to, again, you have to just kind of, it's, it's, it's a bit of homework to do and, and, you know, preliminary work in, in beforehand. I know I wanted to create a, a very intimate dialogue between the piano and I. So, um, when I came back from Christmas, 2018, I was like, on January 1st, January 2nd, you know, I had this piano was brand new and we were just, we, we, I knew the sound I was after. So I, I went for that felted sound. I, I knew that I, I, I had to create an environment with candles and, and, you know, just Persian rug and, and just make it look like a sort of half beat up apartment and feel like I had to kind of get there because every element, the more senses you are able to awaken, the more you feel that the, uh, the experience is authentic and pure, if that makes any sense. So it's like going sense. to a, a Cirque du Soleil show. Um, sometimes, you know, they'll even pump stuff in the, in the air, uh, some oxygen and some, some sense. And, and, and the music's another sense, the visual's another sense. So, so the more that you can awaken, um, the more that it's going to be believable and truthful. So, uh, and the same thing goes, I mean, you know, kind of when I, if I'm working with my homies or I'm working on a, on a hip hop tra track, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to be bringing scented candles, you know, to that session per se. It's, you have to, you just, you know, you've got to be yourself, whatever that means. I mean, just, you know, it, you have to be in a place where you're not, you just, you're calm and you're collected, but you, you also, doing your research is such a big part of that process and creating that environment, which is going to create, I think, you know, if my, my, this little room didn't look the way it, it did, I don't, I think that it adds 10% value to my sound. I really do. It's I, fair. I, I couldn't agree more. And this idea of how many creators out there have taken a second and thought about when you feel the most creative, when you're the most connected, what's your environment? What are the people? What is the place? What, what did you do before? What did you do during? What did you do after? And this is what real professional artists do. They go to work and it doesn't have to be perfect. And right now, if you don't have a studio space, you don't have, you, you can create, you know, in it, uh, I've talked about when I didn't have uh, the space that I wanted or when I like what I did and you can be, it can be as simple if, if you need to create while you're on the subway, on, on the train, on the way to work, the, maybe the best thing you can invest in is a $200 set of noise canceling headphones. Sure. If that can put sure. you in the space, it's not like whatever the thing is for you and doing what you can with what you have is if I'm going to extract what I'm hearing from Stefan's comments there, it's, the people who do this professional, they craft the experience that they want to have. Sure, it may be privileged to be able to own the fancy Yamaha piano or to be able to have the felt uh, applied and customized, maybe the candles, the all, all these things. But if you are a professional and you sit down to go to work, you might as well create the environment architecturally, emotionally, conceptually, spiritually, whatever it is that that you have created that makes your heart sing when you performed your best. This is why athletes have rituals. This is why it's not an accident. hundred percent. I mean, I get so upset when somebody says, well, I don't have the fancy microphones. Well, that's bullshit. I mean, I didn't have the fancy microphones and I took the risk on myself. I, I you know, and you, 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 we, you go broke and, and you, you, if you believe in yourself, if you've got something to say, there's no one else that's going to believe in you more than you, you have to do it. And the flip side to the comment on creating space, everything I concur with everything you just said, I also know because I'm guilty of it is too much fussiness. It, mm. it, we do it when we're nervous. You know, the great architect Frank Gehry uh, says every time before he starts a project, he just makes sure his pencils are in the right place and the paper is the right way. And he sits and stares at it for like hours <laughs> because <laughs> it's not until you put your first strike and you kind of go, where's that C sharp going to lead me to right now? It could, you know, lead me to, or, or this, and it, you make decision after decision after decision after decision, and you have to be so confident in your decisions, um, and and also you have to know that it's okay to make the wrong decision. And but this so, is this is like, if people ask what it's like to be a professional and go to work. This, this is to me as one of the biggest gaps in our culture in understanding 
what, and, and you do not have to, to be crystal clear, you do not have to, if you're watching this, listening to Stefan, you do not have to be a professional musician. You do not have to be a professional artist to get value out of exercising your own creativity. But if you want to, or if you want to develop your craft in such a way as the professionals develop it, listen to what Stefan is saying. This is what true professionals do when they go to work. What worked last time? What mood do I want to create? What, you know, what headspace is it helpful to be in? And doing what you can to put it. You talked about uh, a, a bunch of life changes that you have just recently gone through. Of course. You, you sat in those in order to create this. That is what a professional does. I, 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 you know, a lot of people are probably listening to this and they're not near a, a, a Mecca center like LA or New York. And, and I need to remind them, I, I'm born in a small town. I don't, I was, I never lived here and, uh, and, you know, I had to move here physically. I had to apply for immigration, get, you know, come across the, you know, it's, it's, it's complex stuff, but it's, it was all driven by my passion for music. You think about it. It was all driven because I felt like I had something to say. Um, you know, professional doesn't mean better. It just means that you're getting paid to do what you love to do. But at one point, every professional had to take a risk on themselves. Mm -hmm. And and um, there are probably sometimes even better piano players living in Arkansas, possibly. And just, but you know, if if you're not going to put yourself in, in the arena to be showcased, that you can't complain. Uh, you have to. There's just so much. Um, Again, I, the failure part is so important. It's so it's important to be able to make mistakes and, and get back up and to know that you know the only way that you're going to grow, the only way that you're going to get better is when you find out that that's not as nice as that. And so so just, just do it. Like literally, just do it. That's and the best advice, and it comes. It comes. It, it, it's easy to receive that in a hard way if you are stuck right now. And so I'm looking at you, who might be looking at me, and be stuck right now. You, you have to listen to Stefan. You have to, because there is nothing else. If you're in um, your parents' basement making music and you want to have a voice that changes lives and impacts others, you do not have to. You can have you can extract all of the value of art for yourself just in the creative process. But if you want to do something more than that, it's on you. If you don't believe in you, who will? Of course. Right. As, as you've just 100%. said, 100%. Um, Vanessa, Julio, uh, Sheila, another Stefan, mm -hmm. another Gary, Joan. Again, we've got the. Uh, a global audience that are asking if you've got time for one more, we're coming up on 90 minutes and I want to make sure that you've played everything that you want to play. Stefan. Um, I'm thinking, I mean, there's so much, um, <laughs> now you've got, this is a huge album too, by the way, 16 tracks on the piano. That's, I mean, <laughs> wow. Yes. And you, you said you wrote 20 something hours worth of music. I wrote 23 hours plus, um, listen to all 23 hours you know I, I reduced to approximately three hours and then eventually those three hours you know technically i have you know two more albums in the can and ready to go it's oh. just that i i you know the 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 art of the album is lost in today's playlist world which is not a bad thing or a good thing but i i still you know being a bit old school myself i love artists who have visions um when for example when picasso says i'm going to go through my blue period you know, for so many years, Picasso was painting just blue, black paintings and there's there's and there's consistency. So, uh, for example, pre the playlist, you know, when I would listen to great soundtracks and film scores that I love that would allow me to study or read to in, in university, um, there was always one or two songs that came off the score that just didn't make sense. And you'd have to get up and change it. So I think that was another element that you know, curating the order of the songs for me, the vinyl that's coming up for this album was so important. Um, that everything sort of like made sense and it had a flow to it. Um, but I'll stop talking because no, no, can I, I make sure before I want to put a put my bit in for the vinyl when it comes out? You're gonna vinyl, give me the heads again, up. Yeah, so excited about the vinyl because I, I just I heard a test of it a few weeks ago and it sounds it, it's you know, for those of us who grew up with vinyl, it puts you right in a in a headspace and in, in a place. Um, 
Uh, Nuit blanche, because uh, I'm French as well. Uh, this just means like sleepless night. And uh, haven't we all had sleepless nights? Um, that's this piece. Incredible. Thank you. Uh, Stefan Macchio, for those of you who joined late, um, congratulations on your new album. Congratulations on all those Grammy and Academy noms and uh, hit songs with Celine Dion, The Weeknd, My Cyrus, Seal. Blah. I, I, I could, I could well, list more. You know, no, and you know, it's funny. We, we say those things because we have to say them, but and they give context to who the person is. But, you know, here I am on the other side of it. It's just, it, you know, I'm just still struggling at the end of the day to just put out great music. That's all. That's all. That's all it is. It's just like you get out of bed every time, every day, and 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 your 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 goal is okay. Well, so I did that. I mean, I you you have to push it forward, and and um, and I look back at my life. It's exciting to say that stuff, uh, but more importantly. Um, Half the time I'm tormented on, you know, the, the chords that I'm, I'm wrestling with that day or the sound of the piano and, and you know, and how it's going to, you know, I, 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 and I just say this, Chase, because, I, again, I, I've been there. I've been in that house. I've been, you know, 14 years old, frustrated, knowing I was going to, you know, create melodies that the world was going to sing. But I just didn't know how I was going to get there. Didn't know how I was going to get there. And I had those questions and and I'm just kind of trying to answer those questions for my 13, 14, 15 year old self. Um, and it's just, you just keep on doing it. You know, David Foster, it's just so serendipitous that you had him on, but I mean, he's a Canadian like myself, but he'd heard me play when I was 18. And David said to me when I was 18, he says, all I know is that you are, you have the potential to be world-class. You are amazing, but no one's going to do it other than you. You have to keep on trucking, just keep on moving forward. You know, and, and here we are 25 years later, a friendship and, 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 um, um, it's it's uh, it's that same thing. You know, we the answer is not an easy one. And people think that it's just going to be all of a sudden this ma this magical answer. And it's going to be, ah, oh, hey, man, it's going to open up. It's it's, it's just work. Work it's just it's just work, but work your passion, work your passion do. I mean, when I'm doing a project, a lot of times I put signs up and say, follow your gut, meaning don't try to be something else musically that you're not. And every time that I do that, like I try to be who I am, it works. It just connects with people. And you have to you have to remind yourself sometimes. Well, I want to echo a comment that I just read uh, from Ash Jensen, which is big thank you to ever whoever had you start playing the piano. Must have been your parents. <laughs> it, was, it was my parents, yeah. Thank you. Well, grateful uh, thank you. for them steering you. And, of course, more grateful for all of the uh, decades of work you've put in. Congratulations. It's been incredible to have you on the show. Um, and just a quick recap, new album, um, Tales of Solace, out 
in 30 days here. Um, there's a couple of links in the comments below if you're watching where you can pre-order that or order it when it comes out. Um, Stefan Macchio, uh, somewhere between around three to four years in the making to have you on the show. And I'm glad we were patient and congrats on the new album. Um, any place you'd like to steer folks? I know you're, you're Stefan Macchio at, uh, on most of the social channels where I pay attention to you. Yeah. That's S T E P H A N M O C C I O. If you are, uh, listening now and you want to go follow anywhere else, you'd steer folks who, uh, want to get more of what we just sampled here in our conversation today. No, I mean, you said all, all the socials and, of course, uh, streaming platforms, uh, Apple Music and Spotify, Deezer. I mean, there's, there's Amazon. Um, it, and if anything, um, I hope that I get to see uh, many of you when I have the chance uh, to tour, whenever that will become possible as well. I mean, you know, when you think about how that's impacted artists in the last three, four months, I mean, that's, you know, artists' livelihood. They can't go out and perform. So we have avenues like this um and your show uh, to, to 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 bring the music to people but um i just hope that you can come up and experience a live show because that's for me in my art that's where it's at uh the the, uh, the live experience i will trust that you will let me know and i will be happy to share that you will. with uh i'll with see you in seattle creative, creative community <laughs> that uh, pays attention to what i'm doing and again so grateful um, look forward to, to connecting, uh, the next time I'm in LA or that we're able to travel. Uh, and for those of you who may be curious, we are going to continue this conversation for just a few more minutes over at my Instagram. We're going to do a little Instagram live, uh, momentarily. And the same as if, uh, if you follow, uh, Stefan, he will, uh, I think he's just going to join my IG live. Is that what we're going to do? Uh, that's what I'm going to do. I think. I'm All just, right. Yeah, All right. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. I am grateful, and to all of the folks who behind the scenes made this happen, Adam and John and Nasa and Julie on on our end, uh, and I know you've got some management and labels and all those things that, that, again, long time in the making to be able to perform these songs that are not yet out live on the air. I want to say thanks to everyone involved. So signing off. Chase, Stefan. you thanks, are man. amazing. Amazing. Thank you. Really. Just thank you for so, what you do. Well, thank you, man. Thank you. You're no, you're no, you're, no, no. you're the star today. It bask in it, and uh, we'll uh, see no. you all over at uh, on on my IG channel here shortly. Until then, hopefully tomorrow. Stay tuned. Hey guys, what's up? It's Chase Jarvis, founder and CEO of Creative Live. You all know that we have more than 2,000 classes and more than 10,000 hours of learning, inspirational, and motivational content on the platform. I'm super excited to announce a new experience on Creative Live. It's called Fast Class. You've told us that you're busy and sometimes it's hard to dive into a full class from start to finish. So, essentially we're now giving you a shortened highlight version of our top Creative Live classes. You can always dive into the full class with five, 10, or 15 hours of great content, but now if you're just looking to focus on a few of the highlights or wanna be able to skip quickly to something that really interests you, you can now get a shortened fast class version of that class. We're also thinking this might be able to help you explore a new craft and save time while doing it. This is a great tool to curate your learning experience to help create the life that you seek. So you're probably thinking, great, how do I access this new experience on Creative Live? That's easy. All you have to do is be a subscriber to the Creator Pass, and then all this is yours. If you're feeling isolated and looking for creative connection, by tuning into creativelive.com slash TV. That's where we've got a 24 seven live stream from the kitchen counters. I can do that back lit shot that I really like to do. From the studios and living rooms of many of the world's top creators where we're doing musical performances, Q and A's, cooking shows, virtual book tour events, drawing, spoken word poetry, and more. 
Life passed me by waiting for an invitation when the world is greater than my nation or my occupation. Be someone you've never been. You feel all that adrenaline, it's medicine. It actually helps me feel like my days are more purposeful. I hope that out of this deep pain will come some collective growth. Dive into Creative Live TV today.